that uh, you can, you know, if you don't remember what happened, uh, you're, you can still survive. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still connected to yesterday, so I'll tell you the relationship with this. Okay, uh, so I want to start with a definition, um, maybe a provisional. Will be the theme for this talk is studying actions on bifoliated planes that resemble those that come from the Ananasa flow acting on its orbit space, like we saw yesterday. So, definition uh, just a group acting on a plane. This key represents just an abstract R2, a plane uh, with two transverse. Invariant foliation. Such an action is called, we call it an autopsy like. Okay, if the following properties are satisfied, three we saw yesterday. Uh, so axiom one is that if some element of your group fixes some leaf of either one of the foliations, doesn't matter, uh, then uh, there's a fixed point in that leaf. And uh, the action of G on the, not just this leaf, like maybe this one's L, but of course there's a leaf of my other foliation through this, um, okay, is topologically contracting on one and expanding on the other. So I'll cartoon that like, uh, in particular, on L and on L prime, uh, there's, there's no other six points to that. Yeah, of F plus or minus. And this is a picture of either G or G inverse, right? I'm not uh, one, one, one contracts one and one extends the other. Globally, globally on the entire leaf, yeah. Uh, so hopefully this is where I came to yesterday, or this seems like a true fact about flows on the orbit spaces, right? This is a picture of the weak stable and weak unstable leaf projected to the orbit space uh, up, up in the universal space. Uh, two is the, the closing lemma type uh, axiom, which says that the set of points so that some element fixes them uh, is dead. Uh, three is uh, because we're not smart enough to uh, totally understand non transitive flows, uh, we'll stick with the transitive case of the transitivity assumption. There exists uh, dense orbit for the action. Of G. Yes, yes. And so I mean, it would be nice if so if you could kind of get, uh, you can't get three from just one and two, but maybe if you sort of soup up uh, some version of those, you could get three out of it. Or you, and you also can't get two from just one and three, but we, you know, a, a stronger version of three gives you a two unit. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I would like to, the, the, these are maybe not the optimal set of axioms. And uh, I would I would be excited to discuss what, what one could do a bit better. Uh, and then the fourth property is one that we didn't interact with yesterday, um, 
but you need something along these lines in order to uh, prove the more sophisticated result. Uh, the fact that what I'm about to write is true for uh, a knockoff clothes is a theorem of Sergio Fenley. And this statement is the following. If you take two leaves from the same foliation that are not separated, like so they're, they're kind of branching points in the leaf space, with L, L prime in either one of your foliations are non-separated, witnessing that the leaf space is not housework, uh, then there exists an element of your group that fixes both. So uh, what is this translated into the language of an Ossoff flows? Fixed points are periodic orbits. Uh, so this says that uh, you see really homotopic periodic orbits on these two non-separated pieces. OK. Uh, and that's all I'll put for now, because that's all we'll need to do today. And the theme, so there's a chance from the same thing. Yeah, maybe I can be more precise or from F minus non separated. Um, at the end of the day, I will have to embarrassingly add a A5 to, to prove a theorem uh, that says something about the structure of the plane and has nothing to do with the action of the group. All right, but I don't want to do that now. And maybe someday someone will get rid of the need for that. So we'll keep it at this list. Uh, this is what I think the list is true. Okay, and the general theme here is that, you know, much of what we already know about an Ossov flows on three manifolds, their structure, uh, transitive and Ossov flows, because that's kind of easy, um, can just be proved from this list of properties. But you can also get some new things. So uh, yesterday I sketch proved the result that uh, should this happen to be a trivially foliated plane, uh, then, and you happen to have one of these actions that really came from an Anasa flow. Actually, wait, you didn't even need that yet. If you had a trivially foliated plane, then your group is conjugate to a group of affine transformations. And hence, if you knew you came from a flow, you could do a bit more work and show that it was a sequential flow. Uh, and then what else did we talk about? We talked about this trichotomy theorem, which says that the possibilities for a plane with a group satisfying these, not even using A4 yet, is that it's either trivial or both leaf spaces are, are and it's not trivial, but it's a skew picture, or both leaf spaces or both foliations are some non house sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, those are all, you know, from things known since the 1990s. Uh, but here's a new theorem for motivation. So maybe I should write some of what I said. So a theme uh, through uh, interesting facts about a close new. Using the some instances we did last time. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, though, uh, this is a more the, the, the class of Anasov like group actions on bifoliated plates is bigger, strictly larger than the class of actions of, on orbit spaces of like three manifold groups that come from Anasov. We have examples. Uh, things that definitely could not have possibly come from a flow that satisfied people. So anything you prove will actually be a more general result. Uh, but our theme is we have to prove that maybe. So for instance, here is a new result as of, I don't know, uh, uh, actually let me say one from a couple of years ago first. This is the theorem that I proved with Tomah bart who you met last week. Um, and it says the following. So it says that 
tentative uh, an offer of those. Um, uh, let me say this version first. Uh, the skew case. So assuming the orbit orbit space is a skew plane, there are many examples of these, and they are classified. By just knowing uh, the free homotopy classes of their periodic orbits. I mean, you have a bunch of loops in your manifold, those are the periodic orbits. And if you know what these are, just as like loops in your manifold, you know the flow up to orbit equivalent. So are classified by their periodic orbits or free homotopy classes. Let me maybe say what I mean a little bit more precisely with this. Uh, more precisely, okay. Uh, let me define, uh, I don't know, pairs the periodic orbit of a flow to be this set is just a set of. Uh, uh, Conjugacy classes of elements of pi one, so free homotopy classes of loops in your in your three manifold, so that uh, gamma is represented by a periodic orbit. Actually, I want something even a little looser than this. I wasn't caring about reversing orientation, but a free homotopy class comes with an orientation. So I will say gamma or its other direction. And oh, the theorem says that, uh, it, or the first version says, if I try. There's time, but I'm not paying attention to it. Our, uh, not the code, which you claim diagonal strip picture orbit space. And they have just the same here set as that, so I would love to see nothing else. Uh, this holds if and only if uh, the two plus flows are orbit equivalent via some uh, map that's isotopic to the other. The set determines the orbit equivalent class. And uh, if you want to do like last time, uh, what happens if I want to understand orbit equivalences by things that are not uh, isotopic to the identity? Well, uh, then what do I do? I just have to take the image of this under the induced map on conjugacy uh, classes in the fundamental group. So that's just some auto automorphism of pi one, you know, I think. Uh, so uh, that's one version, and this was, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, 2021-ish. Um, and then more recently, uh, we have a generalization of this, uh, not just Q planes, but all Anasa flows in uh, pseudo Anasov flows is a generalization that allows for singular foliation in the space. Um, so, more generally, uh, this one to say the vague version, it says that most Anasov and most transitive Anasov and skew Anasov flows are classified by their free homotopy class of the periodic orbit. 
and there's a complete invariant for all of them uh, that is just slightly more complex. So uh, you state this version precisely to give you uh, there's even Frankel as well. I don't know how you tell papers when they're not published yet and when they're going to publish or something like that. There were a couple of years in between of a lot of work. Um, so uh, here, if I have uh, one flow, from here I was assuming that these were Although you only really need one of them sensitive, and then you can see the other one. Here I have five uh, some sensitive anatta, or if you know what two anatta means, that's fine. If not, ignore it for my thought. Um, and uh, here I need either to say exactly the same statement. I need either some like hypothesis on the topology of my manifold or have a flow book. So you could assume, say, your manifold has some nice geometry, like it was hyperbolic, or that it had only hyperbolic pieces in its like or its if in decomposition. Or if you want the most hardcore version of this, uh, uh, here's the assumption, uh, and technical assumption, uh, what do I want is that um, for, let's say it this way, pi, uh, but there is no cipher, pi version of the JFJ decomposition of your manifold such that both the fiber and some other direction. So necessarily, I should talk about the boundary if I can stress it here. Both the fiber direction and some non fiber are both periodic orbits. Uh, I, okay, so in particular, if you have no cipher fiber pieces, this is trivially satisfied. If not, you have to worry. Okay. And if any, you have any other flow. Two to a knockoff. Oh. Flow. And I knew they have the same periodic orbit. Periodic orbits of psi equal periodic orbits of psi, just as three homotopy classes um, or the same three homotopy classes are represented. Uh, same confusion. And in general, a complete invariant uh, of uh, orbit equivalence. We really hope it was the periodic orbits that, um, but there's one trick you could do, but there's only one trick you could do for each one of these fiber fiber pieces uh, that has this kind of bad behavior. You just need kind of a psi data. There's, there's two things that could, that could help. Um, this kind of a choice of sign or Okay, so if this annoying extra hypothesis is just too much to worry about, you could pretend we're trying to classify flows on, say, hyperbolic manifolds. It's already a huge class with many, many, many inequivalent 
clothes and there's a very interesting plasticity problem. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's truly necessary. So in work in progress, uh, maybe I can say this in work in progress. With Koma uh, again uh, and uh, Sergio Fenley. Um, so we had already in mind some examples where this is needed, and we're trying to make kind of a complete list of exactly what could happen. So uh, every time you have one of these types of fiber fiber pieces where periodic orbit is represented and the other one, you can build a non orbit equivalent. You can build another flow that has exactly the same periodic orbit, but is not orbit equivalent. So uh, this extra hypothesis is absolutely necessary if there exists, let's call this, uh, uh, well, I'll say it, cipher fiber C. With that particular behavior uh, as above, there's an almost but not quite symmetry of your flow. There exists some side with uh, uh, the same periodic orbit and is not orbit. So, uh, well, it's this sign thing. So, this is sort of thing that there's kind of only one. So, so, for each one of these, you can kind of build one example. Uh, there's like two classes. Yeah. Yeah. So this means that that phi and psi have opposite. I didn't define psi, but whatever signs we assign, phi and psi here have opposite signs. They are not orbit So They have the same sign. They would be orbit -splitting. Is that there's a move you can do on the cipher fiber to kind of flip the flow and glue it back together. And that's the only thing you can do while preserving I oh three homotopy class with three Yeah. So it's more In the boundary, in, in some boundary component, both both the site, the fiber direction and some other are represented by periodic orbit. But you're right, they could be represented by the same periodic orbit. So uh, this is still true, but they're they're the same periodic orbit, right? They don't have to be the same. Yeah. Uh, other questions? So let me connect this up. This is, these are statements about flows. What's the statement about a map of like actions that gives you these? Um, uh, let me keep this definition for just another minute. Okay. All of these statements, uh, well, Except that in progress, which is a, like a handful of construction goes and goes, um, these classification results all follow from the, the consequence results. Uh, a theorem about a knot of like actions, and you just do the translation. So, uh, what is this? Uh, so this is the, I'm going to state the, uh, the Bartelme Frankel myself version of this and the language of an opera like actions, the more general thing is true. Um, so if I'm given 
uh, to an ensemble like action. Of, this, of some group on a priori two completely different looking bifoliated planes. I F I plus F I minus. Um, I can imitate the same definition, but here instead of periodic orbits, I will have to look for group elements with fixed points. That's what corresponds to a periodic orbit of my slope. So I could define, I don't know, here now doesn't make as much sense because I'm talking about fixed points. Maybe I'll just call it, I don't know, well, I'll use the same word because this is where it came from. So this is going to be the set of elements of my group. So that uh, so I of G had some fixed point in the plane it's acting on. Okay. Uh, and then the statement is if uh, these agree. Then, uh, well, my my action should be constant. Oh, except, oops, I had technical hypothesis there. So I have to translate this way. This, how does this correspond to the language of orbit spaces? Uh, I need to assume one of them doesn't have all an orbit space that looks like this. So the current counterpart, where which will be defined by the end of today, optimistically. Um, it's about a feature that you can really just draw by hand and say if this like topological configuration appears in your orbit space, well, that's the thing you need to keep track of with some fine data. So I want the orbit space, sorry, not the orbit space, the flow. Now I just have a plane. So one of the planes, say it's P1, does not contain a particular feature we call uh three of gallop region uh then these actions are conscious And whatever this means, it's exactly the feature that you see in the orbit space of a flow that has one of these periodic, this type of periodic. And um, of course, I say it this softly if it if it only is uh, statement, the other direction being true here, this was this one. And uh, there's the sort of standard modification if you want to say conjugate up to some osteomorphism. Of uh, your group, just like we did there with you. So, to go from here to there is uh, the work I was doing yesterday um, that, uh, that you can translate between properties of the flow to properties of the action on the order. So, it's not a complicated consequence, it's a direct consequence once you unpack the meaning of, of this into the topology of your manifold with the flow. Okay, so uh, uh, I should say what the complete invariant is, right? So now the complete invariant is for conjugacy classes of an of like action is uh, a choice of sign for each tree of scalloped regions of the same one and the set of elements with the Okay, so what I want to do is uh, get us for some tools to prove for how this works because it, it's nice. And to do that, though, I have to kind of introduce some more features, more 
uh, vocabulary around the study of Anasa flows in their orbit. And in doing so, I will tell you uh, a little bit about what that acting for five was. So, uh, subsection two here, sort of framework for talking about features of, of orbit spaces or bifold units. So let's start with a definition. Uh, actually, let me motivate this definition. We saw two examples that I could draw nice pictures of last time, right? The trivial plane. I have R2 like this, and the skew plane, which uh, the nice way to draw a picture is you, instead of foliating the whole blackboard, uh, you take this, this kind of diagonal strip and you uh, vertically, horizontally foliate it. And what distinguishes the feature that distinguishes these two examples, right, is that well, in this one, every leaf of the blue and intersects every leaf of the orange. And this one, we don't open, and one of the ways we arrived at this picture, right, we were studying kind of the enthemum of orange leaves that do not intersect the grid of uh, uh, given the orange. Or I guess I, what we actually had is the supremum of orange leaves that do intersect the blue one. And that led us to this, like, you know, one at, at that top that almost but not quite intersect. So uh, this idea that there might be a leaf that almost but doesn't quite intersect another, um, and, and this happens, this happens symmetrically. If I go to the blue leaves, this blue one has a reciprocal relationship. It's the first heading this one blue one that does not intersect that point. Uh, that's such a useful concept that it has its own name. It's called a perfect fit. So if I have a bifold unit swing, uh, L, let's say L plus in F plus, and L minus in F minus, are said to make a perfect fit. Uh, if that picture happens, so uh, what do I what do I mean? I have my two leaves. Uh, I want small transversal uh, arcs spaced at each leaf, uh, transverse to them. So if there exists transversal uh, transverse arc, let's call this P minus T plus. And so this is L plus, there's T minus. So that uh, every leaf that intersects T minus intersects L, uh, what's this one is L minus? I'm trying to color code this nicely. Every, every uh, plus leaf that intersects T minus also intersects L minus, and every uh, minus leaf that intersects T plus also intersects L plus. Ah, so wait, I forgot to say something. Okay, number one, my leaf should not intersect. They do not intersect, but they almost intersect in the sense that there's this transverse arc such that L uh, intersects T minus L and F plus. It says T minus equals uh, not empty implies L and sex L minus not empty. And vice versa, switching plus and minus. Wow. So exactly this. Uh, 
Uh, in my two plane, I see also another kind of interesting feature, which is I get well rectangles that are kind of bounded up by perfect fits on our side. So here I picked out this perfect fit. If I choose two other leaves that intersect these ones, I'll you know, highlight them in another color and make a perfect fit down here. In between, I get this nice, uh, trivially just product foliated uh, open rectangle box, right, with a perfect fit on either side, and two other points uh, where, where, where my leaves are. So this is called a lozenge. Another important feature. So uh, lozenge. You can tell I work with many French people because I pronounce lozenge lozenge. Uh, uh, lozenge uh, is uh, open Founded by four leaves, making two perfect fits. So there's only there's only one way that these can be arranged combinatorially. You have a pair making a perfect fit, and then another pair making another perfect fit. And the other place and points of intersections of leaves in the boundary are called points. Now, becoming very well set up to read any one of Sergio's seven points. Um, yeah. Ah, you asked a very exciting question. That never occurs in an ensemble quote. And that is axiom five that I really wish I didn't have to make, but you somehow have to, I cannot prove from the other ones, it becomes essential actually to be here. So uh, like I planted piece in the audience, um, I will remove the provisional from this definition and give you the one that makes the theorem true, which is that, your plane does not, cut, cut, not, does not contain uh, like a four perfect fit quadrilateral. So this feature of perfect fits everywhere could not be seen anywhere in your plane. Uh, why, why do we need to, well, so one, you can prove that this never happens in the Anasov flow case. Um, Two, we're going to understand and reconstruct our plane by what leaves intersect what leaves. And here, any leaf, you can't tell the orange ones apart by saying what blue leaves intersect them. If, because this is trivially foliated, if I enter here with some blue leaf, uh, it exits the other side. So every blue leaf that intersects this one intersects that one, those one, that one as well. You can't distinguish it. So this feature appears in your plane. Uh, you have a really hard time telling these apart. Maybe there's some construction where you can, I don't know, like take care of something that not of like actually satisfying these for do some kind of like blow up inserting one of these new things and put this new one. I don't know. Uh, that would be very cool uh, to show that this is really a different thing. This thing was called something like a zero four quadrilateral by by ten leaves, but that's exactly the thing we want to do. Okay, uh, why are these important definitions? Uh, here is uh, I'll say it as I said, all facts. I'm just going to follow up on a theorem. Here's a fact: any non-trivial law. Uh, Orbit space or bifoliated plane with an off of like action. Um, I'll just write this piece with the assumption that uh, 
uh, when I write a point in the two foliations, I mean one that either you think of as an orbit phase or one that emits it and off of like action of the group. Contains many molecules. Many leaves that make for the six many molecules. All right, so in the, in the two phase, I hope this is obvious. I just pointed out how like any perfect any leaf makes a perfect fit with someone else, and then you take any other two that you said to get a lot of So the non two phase, uh, this follows uh, this follows from the, by the following theorem of Fenn. Well, Maybe I'm going to now rephrase it. Oh, because he puts this for a knockout flow is so using the orbit space and the flow. And uh, if you stare hard at his group and rework it a little bit, it just follows from this list of axioms, particularly axiom four. So the first step of this in Fenley's version is an assertion that axiom four is true for flows, right? Um, uh, but more generally, once you have that, A1 through A4 implies the following. Uh, well, without A4, I can get this statement. If uh, an element of my group so this is, I have a G and an awesome like action G. Um, if this has more than one fixed point, and it's on the plane. Uh, then uh, there exists a G invariant. Connected uh, chain, I'll say what that means specifically in a minute, of uh, uh, that is that contains all the fixed points of G as corners. Consequently, uh, by four, right? Because you have non Hausdorff leaf space, you're non two plane, you have non Hausdorff leaf space, non two non trivial, non Hausdorff leaf space. Uh, there exist elements that fix more than one leaf. So, this, by axiom one, they have more than one fixed point. So, this implies that you have. Uh, well, then is to kind of interpolate between the two of them. So there are low edges in your point. Okay. Consequently, uh, A4 now implies that there exists uh, such elements and there exists. So Acting for the assertion that that's true is the first uh uh, uh is, a, is, a, is a part one of the family theorem and here's sort of a part uh, two in the next piece. So let me draw a picture of what I mean by uh pain. You know, what this kind of thing is. Yeah. Oh, oops. Yeah, talking and not writing makes two fixed points. All right, do I have an English sentence now? I think so. Okay. So, uh, in this skew case, this happens all the time, right? So, let's draw the easy version first of why this is true. If I have a fixed point for some element, well, it fixes the two leaves to them. 
uh, it, last time our whole argument was hinging on you. Do you also, if it takes the weed leaves, it fixes, well, it preserves the set of things that intersect this blue ray, right? And so uh, when I say fix, I really mean fix every half leaf. Like I didn't wrote this. Um, it flicks every blue, every everything that intersects with blue ray that becomes an invariant set. So the supremum of that set is also preserved by G. So you fix this leaf as well. And also this one, right? And then I can keep going. I find a new fixed point where these intersect. And uh, then I play the game again. I find a new fixed point, et cetera. And the set of points fixed by G looks like, well, just this picture up and down. I have a discrete set that form the corners of a bunch of lozenges stacked together. This is one example of a chain of lozenges. Okay, so that's an example. In general, what can happen in the non-skew case, I might have something that looks like this, but you know, this is not my plane anymore. It's not just nicely trivially correlated. I might have something more general where uh, beside this lozenge, I see another one. So maybe there is a leaf here and another leaf here that intersects uh, at this point here. And this is another fixed point. That type of behavior can happen in general. And uh, here I've drawn another lozenge. These are your corners. And these, sorry, these are its corners. And those are the kind of ideal points that are not really part of our there could be more on this side. Yeah, there could be more continuing in a whole row here. Oh dear, that's a corner. That's an ideal point. So you know, I need to make another. And it's not skew, it becomes harder to draw. So this could be a perfect fit. Uh, let's see. Yeah, corner, and they can go all over the place. Uh, but the assertion is that whenever I see a couple of fixed points for some element, maybe it was this one here and that one there, that I can build such a connected collection of lozenges. They don't overlap, they just share sides, share leaves of them, uh, that contains all of the fixed points. Of them. So that's an amazing kind of structure theory of what the plane actually looks like. Many yeah, yeah, so in in the general case, I can't say anything extremely precise, except that uh, you know, well, okay, for free, I can say one thing that's precise, which is like, okay, well, there's at least one, and then I take that orbit of this under my whole group, and I get black hole. I mean somehow there's the orbit of the group back and they're the same or whatever, but they'll be all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not up to the action of G. Up to the action of your group, actually, you'll only see five. Uh oh. Uh, depends. You, can, you may see only finite in the Oh, great. Okay, so actually, let me tell you what the mysterious hypothesis was, because now is a convenient time to do it. Uh, what is this scalloped region slash tree of scalloped region? All right. So uh, just because I know you're all curious. All right. So here's what a scalloped region is. Uh, I could draw a very an, an infinite all in a long line, not like this skew case, but differently arranged, a uh, bunch of lozenges, uh, all parallel. Yeah, so how's this gonna look? I need to, I'm trying to draw this efficiently. I have some perfect fits and then I have some points. I'm gonna draw this nicely. Fit, corner, fit. All right, and imagine I kept repeating this picture, it's periodic, right? I could keep doing this forever and fill out my plane. Okay, uh, I'm gonna run out of space though, so let me start scratching them up and making them uh, smaller. All right, so I'll get all these parallel things. 
And um, but I but but it can occur that they really do get smaller as I represent them, and these vertical sides of my one's edges I'm attaching together accumulate on a union of leaves. And this goes and this accumulates uh, on some non housework looking boundary, an infinite family of blue leaves. This, this is a fine looking region to have in my plane um, by putting horizontals here. I can draw some lozenge looking things going in the opposite direction. I call this a corner. This a perfect fit. And go this way. And at the opposite side, I can make a corner and a perfect fit with another thing. And in the interior of this region, which is bounded by this Blah, this bumpy shape with an infinite collection of leaves on each side, a by infinite collection. So I'm going to extend this picture symmetrically over here. You have to accumulate on some by infinite union of blue leaves. Uh, so I've described uh, bifoliated regions. The interior of this is just homeomorphic to some open disk. Right? Uh, it's bounded by infinite collections of leaves making perfect fit. And I can think of it as a union of lozenges in two different ways. A bunch of parallel ones going across, or a bunch of parallel ones, I only drew one, but there's many, right? Going up, there's one adjacent to here. Or the uh, this complicated picture is a thing that does appear. Uh, this is given the name scallop solution. This appears in, in the phases of, uh, of flows when you see this in certain, uh, uh, in particular, when you have ciphered fiber pieces where the fiber is represented by a periodic orbit. That translates into a picture like this in the orbit. Um, what's the word scallop doing here? I, I think like this is a fancy word for uh, things that look like this. Um, uh, and it's found. Okay, a tree of scalloped regions is where, well, you know, uh, I I start doing this in all directions. I continue. I have some nice nice spot here I could fill out with uh, another lozenge, so I keep going. Okay. But the slick way to define a tree of scalloped region is, um, basically you're supposed to think of it, I see these going uh, everywhere, but here's the definition. Uh, a tree of scalloped region is a subset of your plane uh, connected that consists of just a, a union of disjoint lozenges and their boundaries. They share sides, so the, the leaves that bound them is also included in this connected subset with the property that Every lozenge is bounded on both sides. So let's ignore this horizontal picture. I don't need to think of this as going one way. Uh, don't have too much info on the blackboard. Just the part you're supposed to think of. So here's a collection of uh, lozenges so that everyone has a friend on each side. I want to go in the opposite direction too. So that was my one scallop region. If I kept going, and put another lozenge here, like I was doing in my previous picture. So this bit, this bit in the corner, and I keep going. Ah, and I do this in all possible ways. Uh, I will get a tree of scallop regions where the connected subset formed by this joint 
clause hinges and their boundaries. So that each lozenge shares each of its four sides with another. Uh, how to say this in that short form? Each lozenge surrounded by others, by others on all sides. So what this picture of a scallop region is supposed to convince me, which we need a little work for, is that if I if I if I have a version where they all get I get everyone on all two sides, there's like a way to fill it out kind of uniquely into the scallop region. And so if I now start to do in the opposite direction, I uh, instead of on the blue side drawing this infinite strip, I go along the orange, I'll make another infinite strip. And then I'll find some other parts I haven't done yet and I'll have to keep going. The whole thing inherits this kind of keyword. Okay, and this is the feature that you see in the orbit phase exactly when you have one of these particular cypher fibers. Okay. Uh, but that's a, I mean, that's an interesting curiosity and something that tells us the link. Uh, between orbit space and flow, uh, but it's okay if you ignore this. Uh, now that your curiosity has been satisfied, what technical hypothesis was? Um, and perhaps since I only have another minute today, uh, I will I will leave this as like here's a bunch of background anatomy of bifold plan and tell you what the plan is for next time. So the theorem I arranged about if you satisfy these axioms. And you uh, have two actions with the same set of fixed points, and we don't see this pathological feature, right? Then your actions are conjugate. Uh, next time, I want to sketch a proof of how that goes. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do that is we're going to try and just like by hand build a map between the two orbit spaces. Uh, and uh, the best guess you can. Um, sending, say, a fixed point of one element here to a fixed point over there, and then work very hard to show that this actually reconstructs the plane with the whole topology is and what's that. So that'll be my plan for next time. I'm done for today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or sort of questions? If no, let's thank Catherine again. So we have lunch in 12 and 14.